I think the message there is you don't have to only teach kids what you know. You can learn things together with the kids, and that can be even more powerful. Uh, my father managed to graduate with his class, you know, a little French tutoring from his grandma, and he went to MIT, where he worked in solid state physics. That's what he did his research in. Uh, they didn't know about trend, much about transistors there, which kind of disappointed him. He also learned to ski in the White Mountains, where he uh, was doing a ski jump behind his professor's house one day, where he had a terrible uh, he broke his arm very badly. Uh, he finished school, married my mother, and moved to Philadelphia, to Philco. This one's kind of out of order. Um, where this is, he had his first two children, that's my brother and me. Um, and he went to Philco because he thought they really needed him. He ended up a small research division. They did a lot of uh, military research, which he came to hate working for the Army. Uh, and when I was about two years old, he got a call from William Shockley, one of the inventors of the transistor, and the man that he, was, he had written a textbook on electronics and he knew so much about how electronics works that people called him, said of him that he could see electrons. Later on, Shockley became famous or infamous for his work in IQ and eugenics but he was uh, undisputably, indisputably a master of electronics. He was forming a new company in California, and when he first called my father after having heard him give the paper, he gave him an IQ test over the phone. <laughs> my father flew out to California for an interview. He was always an optimistic and self-confident person, so on the way to the interview, he put down the down payment on a house. <laughs> And my parents moved to California. My mother thought it was going to be for a few years, but my father never wanted to leave. The problem was that working for Shockley uh, was not as great as you might think because he was a terrible manager, he was paranoid, um, and he was very controlling. When Leslie Berlin, who wrote a, a very good biography of my father called The Man Behind the Microchip, was doing research for that. She looked through a lab notebook of my father's from that time and found sketches and description of a very interesting diode, which she then took to a physics professor who said, wow, this is a, a description of the tunnel diode. This is something that my father had been thinking about and just designed and put in his notebook and went to talk to Shockley about. And Shockley said, don't do this, it's not worth your time. Six months later, a Japanese scientist named, or engineer named Leo Isaki published essentially the same idea, having tested it, and uh, 10 years later, he won the Nobel Prize for the Tunnel Diode. The message here is, well, you can think what the message is. <laughs> Your job is not to quash the ideas of the people in front of you. It's to inspire them. Eight young scientists and engineers grew so fed up working for Shockley that they decided to go and form their own semiconductor company. This, there wasn't VC in those days, so what they did was they wrote to 30 different electronics companies offering and asking to come work for them as a group. And most of these companies, as you can imagine, kind of laughed at this group of scientists who thought that they were better than a Nobel Prize winner because actually Shockley had won the Nobel Prize that year. But eventually, they did go to work for Fairchild Cam Camera and Instrument. They opened a division called Fairchild Semiconductor. The first year there was an incredibly productive year for all of them, and that was the year that my father invented the integrated circuit. He's co uh, he's co credited for that with Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments. Before long, Fairchild Semiconductor grew to be the major profit center within Fairchild. Cameron Instrument, my father, was the leader of the group of scientists, eventually became vice president. Uh, but Fairchild Cameron Instrument didn't write, really think that these young folks from the uh, West Coast were quite up to the job. Uh, my father used to fly every three weeks to Syosset, New York, to, to uh, go to board meetings. And he said one day, he flew in, it was 
very early in the morning. It was a, a snowy day. He took a cab as far as he could. He walked the rest of the way to the corporate headquarters. And when he got there, no one else had bothered to come in. And he told me afterwards that that was the day that he decided he was going to leave Fairchild. Uh, the official story is that he was passed over to become uh, the president of the whole company and decided to leave at that point. I think both of those things are true uh, and they're related to each other. It was kind of a state company at that point. So my father and his partner Gordon Moore went off to start Intel. And the message here is when the place that you are in is really stifling and keeping you from doing what you want to do, creating what they want to create, it's time to move on. They went on to found Intel. Uh, they wrote a two paragraph uh, business plan. The investment banker rose, raised all the money over the phone in the first 48 hours and they started the company, which started off making memories and then uh, moved on to some other things. And there was a young engineer named Ted Hoff who came to my dad saying, you know, I think I can design this thing that this Japanese calculator company wants from us all on one chip. And my father said, good, go ahead, do that. I'll give you the time, I'll give you the space. And while other things were going on and everybody else was working on trying to increase yield, this one person, Ted Hoff, went off and did his work and invented the microprocessor, which became Intel's, one of Intel's great products. So this is sort of the anti-story to the tunnel diary story. Mm. Um, okay. After a number of years at Intel, my father uh, became, he went from being president to chair to vice chair, really a spokesperson working, uh, speaking a lot to Congress. He was very worried about Japanese uh, competition in the electronics industry, such as it had been in the consumer electronics car industry. And he advocated for the creation of an entity called Sementech, which would bring together researchers from many different electronics companies to see if they could work together to improve manufacturing. And uh, well, that's a picture of us when we were little. It's a picture of my dad at my wedding. This picture of my dad with my oldest child. That's all. I mean, we don't have very good pictures. But anyway, the. Um, uh, the Congress eventually decided to establish Semitech, but to my dad's disappointment, instead of being placed in Silicon Valley for political reasons, it ended up being placed in Austin, Texas. He led the, um, the group, the search committee for uh, the leader of this Semitech. They couldn't find anyone who was willing to leave industry and go head up this new group. And finally, my stepmother said to my dad, if you really think it's that important, you have to do it yourself. So he agreed to head up Semitech, which he did for two years. He attracted people from all over the industry, people who are competitors, to work together. He developed a method of working with small suppliers and helping them improve their processes so they would be able to keep the electronics industry going. And you can see that the American electronics industry remains very strong today. Uh, his work during those two years consisted of constant travel, and whenever he was back at the headquarters, he sat in the smoking room, the only room in the whole place where you were allowed to smoke. My father was a terrible smoker all his life, and uh, he, he died of a heart attack at age 62, sudden death, completely unexpected, a week after an executive physical. So that was a big shock, and that was when uh, I started reevaluating what I was doing, and, made some decisions about working some in education. One thing I forgot to say is that my father throughout his life loved adventure. He managed to get back to his love of flying. He, he did take flying lessons. When we were little kids, my mother persuaded him not to do it until we were grown up, so she was not a widow with small children. Um, he had a seaplane. He uh, flew in a jet once, a military jet. He uh, taught took gliding lessons with me. He learned scuba diving. He was always an adventure skier. He, he did helicopter skiing in the Bugaboos in Canada every year. And he would try anything, horseback riding, figure skating. He was a, quite a gifted athlete. So that was the me message there was, have adventures, have fun, 
throughout your life even while you're engaged in all this serious work. Well, what do I draw from all of this? My father was a charismatic leader, and one of the things that I, I really came to understand this after his death, I knew him as my father, and I knew he was an important person, but so many people came up to me in his memorial service. I read what people said about him in the San Jose Mercury. And I think my father was kind of a shy person, even though he was precarious. He liked to be around other people, but he wanted someone else to arrange it. And he, um, he listened to people. He looked them in the eye, and he tilted his head, and really listened to them. And he really believed in them. He was an optimist, and he was an optimist about people. He believed in their capacity. He believed in their goodwill. He believed that given freedom and the chance to regulate themselves, in a democracy, people would do the right thing. And I think that is probably one of the final messages for teachers is to really believe in our students and to believe in them accurately, believe in them for the strengths that they have, that we know that they have from listening and observing. Okay. Well, I spent a little, about as much time on that as I expected. And now we are going to part two of the talk. So you just imagine your me moving from one part of life and one career to another. And this part of the talk is called Inspiring the Next Generation in Mathematics and Science. It will be a little bit more about science and engineering than mathematics, so I, please forgive me, those of you who are in mathematics. Um, and what I'm really going to say to you is that I think that for a number of years we gave kids or under the pressure of the industry, we've been giving kids the wrong messages about why we want them to 